Okay. Now, I'm going to be just sticking to these four questions today. And maybe if you have time later on, we can interact a little bit. So um, if you have questions, maybe you can uh, just keep it related to these four questions that I will be covering today. Okay, all right. Um, all right, we're already streaming live on Facebook. So I'm just gonna take a look at the questions that I have, and then we're gonna go straight into it. Okay, welcome back everyone from last Wednesday. We had a really, really powerful and enlightening session. We talked about uh, once saved, always saved. Uh, we had other questions that we covered about the thorn in the flesh for Paul. So I felt today to cover these four questions. And the four questions are these. Um, is Jesus the only way to God? How can a good God send people to hell? Is the Bible God's, uh, is the Bible's moral code outdated? And thirdly, why is there so much pain and suffering if God is good? Now, why is it important to answer questions? Because questions are always out there in the world. And the world will always ask us questions for the reason why we believe. And the Bible says, always be ready to give an answer to those who question you. Now, when our own answers are, when our own questions are answered, it establishes our faith. It causes our faith to be strong. It causes our faith to be sure. And then we are able to have an answer uh, to the world for the peace, the joy, the belief that we have in Jesus Christ. And that's why we want to be answering these questions. All right, first question we're going to ask is, is Jesus the only way to heaven? Now, if we look at the world in entirety today, the world is really quite a religious world. If I look at the statistics of different religions, Christianity has about 2.4 2 billion adherents, Islam about 1.9 billion, Hinduism about a billion, um, atheists, um, seculars, non-religious, humanists, however they may call themselves, that's about 1.1 billion. Buddhism has about 500 million adherents, Chinese traditional religion, about 400 million. And the others, Sikhism, Spiritism, Judaism, Baha'i, Jainism, con uh, they constitute all the rest, including animistic religions and so on. And these are just statistics from, um, these are just statistics from um, the internet, Wikipedia, all right? So is Jesus the only way to God? Now, I have lived, uh, in different parts of the world, different countries, studied in different schools and colleges. And I've had the privilege of having friends of many faiths and uh, discussing with them and just spending life with them. And I've always uh, encountered them asking questions regarding the exclusivity of Christianity. They are concerned about why Christianity seems to uh, alienate themselves from all other religions by exclusive claims of Jesus Christ. And so if you really look at Christianity, there seems to be a great difference between our faith and all the other faith. Now, millions of people in other religions also say that they have encountered God. Uh, they have built marvelous civilizations like our own civilizations in India, cultures, Islam and have had their lives and characters changed by the experience of that faith. But Christians, they say that only they will go to heaven and that only their religion is a right and true religion. Now this exclusivity, it seems to be very intolerant. Uh, it seems to be hateful. It seems to be um, something that alienates ourselves from all other people and even in today's uh, religion and politics in the world, it seems to be a threat to social unity and even to international peace. Now, many, those who are seekers of truth, they cannot seem to commit to Christ because they find the exclusive claims of Christ. Because Jesus said, I am the only way. They find it close-minded, judgmental, intolerable, and even arrogant. 
And people now, they seem to be more drawn to a syncretistic view of life, which says that all religions lead to God. Um, they would say things like, just find the one that suits you. Um, you know, there is no um, absolute truth, it's all relative. Find the one that really speaks to your heart and which is good for you. Now, can we really um, bank on these statements as truth? Okay. Now, the claims of the Bible itself create, uh, create the controversy. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. He said, there is no name given from heaven by which we can be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. All right. So Jesus himself claimed exclusivity. Now, we have to examine these statements and the claims of the Christian faith, whether it is true, so that we can have a firm foundation for what we believe. Now, we know that God can reveal himself all over the world. And in every religion also, there are what we find love, joy, peace, truth, honor, respect, and morality, and so on. But Christ, if we examine the Bible, it seems that he is the fullest revelation of God that we have and the only sure way to salvation. So we have to examine this in order to come to a proper answer to the question, is Jesus the only way? So let's examine six perspectives here that will help us to answer this question. All right, number one, let's just own up to the fact that all truth claims in all religions are essentially exclusivist. It's not only Christianity, but also Buddhism and Islam that are exclusivist. What do I mean by that? See, any truth claim is by nature exclusivist. When Buddha says the Vedas are wrong, he was essentially saying the belief that the Veda scriptures are right is a wrong belief. When Muhammad in Islam said, Jesus was no more than a prophet because that's what the Quran says, he is saying that the belief in Jesus as a divine savior is wrong. When a person embraces the popular culture belief of today that all religions lead to God, then they are essentially saying that the belief that all religions don't lead to God, like Christianity, they're saying that it's a wrong belief. Now, when the atheist says there is no God, he's essentially claiming exclusive belief, that the belief in God is a wrong belief. So every belief system is exclusivist, not just Christianity. All right, so we have established that. Number two, we should not measure whether something is true by whether it suits us. Now, nowadays, people choose to believe what is popular, what the majority believe, because it suits us. It is convenient. In the Western part of the world, it was convenient to believe in Christianity because it was popular to do so. In Nagaland, where there's majority Christianity, it is convenient to believe in Christianity, go to church because it is popular. It is the majority belief. Now in the West, Christianity's popularity is dropping. So now it is popular for people to just be secularists, to be uh, humanists. And a lot of Christians are also leaving the faith because people want to believe something that suits them, suits their personal preservation. Now, rather than accepting a belief because the majority holds to it, we should evaluate every claim by whether it is true, whether it is small followers or big followers, large followers. You know, I believe in the gift of the speaking in other tongues because I've examined it and I know it is true. But the majority of believers in Nagaland may not believe in that because the majority are from a denomination that don't adhere to that uh, charismatic beliefs of the Holy Spirit. But whether the majority believes or not, we should examine the truth and then hold on to it. For example, right now in China, there's a cult called the cult of the Almighty God, Church of Almighty God. And it started in, in China uh, through a woman and you see, every religious movement starts with 
some people that came that 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 claim they have a revelation about God, and then they gain followers, and then in time it grows. Christianity also grew with just twelve people, and then fifty, a group of disciples. Currently, the world's largest religion. So even though at that time it grew with just twelve people, they had other religions that were bigger. So the thing that we must look at is whether the claims are true rather than whether it is the majority believe. And if it is really true, then it will in time grow. Jesus himself said that you cannot destroy truth. The seed will continue to grow because the seed is the truth. So we must always examine every claim to whether it is true, not whether it is popular, not whether it is the popular belief of our times. The third statement we need to look at is this. We must look at the statements of Jesus that reveal that he is completely unique when compared to all the other religious founders. Look at all the other religions founders, Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad. You know, people would put them on equal level with one another. But if you claim, I mean, if you examine the claims of these religious founders and we compared with the claims of Jesus, we find that Jesus is absolutely unique. Why? Number one, Jesus alone claimed to be God. No founder of any religion has claimed to be God. They have claimed to find the way to God, but no one claimed he is God. Only Jesus, only Jesus claimed he is God. He said in John chapter 10, I believe verse 30, I and my father are one. He claimed to be God. He claimed to come from heaven. He said, I am from above. Not only that, he claimed to forgive sins. No founder of any religion claimed to forgive sins. In fact, Buddha himself was saying, I don't know the way uh, to salvation. And I don't even know whether the good works I have can forgive me of my sins. Now, Jesus is the only one who claimed to be able to forgive sins. Not only that, he claimed to, raise, to be raised from the dead. He claimed that one day he will come back and he will judge the world as the judge of the world. He claimed to be sinless. Now, we have to examine these claims and, number one, conclude whether it was true. But nevertheless, the claims that he makes makes him pretty unique. All right? The second thing that Jesus claimed is that the entire faith of Christianity is centered on himself, the person of Christ, not rules and regulations or a path, but on himself. You see, if you were to take Muhammad out of Islam, Buddha out of Buddhism, Confucius out of Confucianism, you will still have a faith system that, was, that is relatively intact, that religion can survive without the founder. However, if you take Christ out of Christianity, the whole ship will sink. Why? This is because Jesus centered his faith on the faith of Christianity on himself. He said, this is what it means to have eternal life, to know God the Father and Jesus Christ. In John chapter 17, verse 3, he said, I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No founder of any religion has ever said such statements. He says, I am the door. I am the resurrection and the life. All right. So the claims of Jesus are very outrageous, extremely outrageous, that we must conclude he, that either he was a madman to claim such things, or he was lying, or he was telling the truth. There is no other conclusion. We can never conclude that he was a good man. A good man will never claim that he is God. We cannot claim that he was a good teacher. No good teacher claims that he is God. The claims that he makes are absolutely outrageous that it is, either it is true or he was a madman. All right. In fact, uh, the Bible says, and Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's see if I can find it here. He says in Verse 14, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. In other words, it says, if Christ did not rise from the dead, Christianity is empty. It's a dead religion. It has no life. So the whole faith of Christianity is centered on Jesus himself. The person of Jesus, 
the sacrifice of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. Without this, we have nothing. We have nothing. Of all religions, we are the worst. Woe upon us if there is no Christ. The third thing that we must examine of Jesus' claim is this. He alone based the entire Christianity on grace, on grace. Now, long time ago, a conference of Christian leaders were discussing what makes Christianity unique. And C.S. Lewis, a great apologist from Oxford, answered the main question, answered uh, the main question and said, it's grace. What makes Christianity unique is grace. Grace is undeserved, unmerited favor. All religions of the world have a system of works that earn divine approval, a system of self-righteousness. Hinduism have the law, karma, uh, transmigration of the soul. Um, Buddhism has karma, you know, or the eightfold path. Um, it's all based on what you do. That means you earn merits based on your works. Judaism has the Torah, the Ten Commandments. Islam has the five pillars. Each religion has a way of earning God's acceptance through religious and moral effort. But only Christ tells us there is nothing we can do to earn salvation, to make God love us, to become righteous. There's nothing that we can do. Only what he has done for us, his sacrifice, his atoning act on the cross, dying for us, his grace for us gives us the gift of salvation. So all religions are essentially about human beings trying to reach God by the good works. But only Christianity is about God reaching mankind through his grace, through his love. So that's what sets us apart. You see, the essence of all religious beliefs is this. Obey and you will be accepted by God. Obey and you will be accepted by God. But the way of Christ is very different. The way of Christ is God has accepted you in Christ. Believe this. Believe. It's not obey. It is believe. Believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that is why only the Christian faith can offer freedom from sin, self-condemnation, self-righteousness, and from guilt. It is grace alone. You too, the band, the founder of Bono, believer in Christ, all right? Now, this is what he says about how we understood grace. You see, the center of all religions is the idea of karma. You know, what you put out comes back to you. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, or in physics, in physical laws, every action is met by an equal or opposite reaction. It's clear to me that karma is at the very heart of the universe. I'm absolutely sure of it. Now, this is what he says, Bono. And yet along comes this idea called grace, to bring an end to all that as you reap, you will sow stuff. Grace defies logic and reason. Love interrupts, if you like, the consequences of your actions, which in my case is very good news indeed because I've done a lot of stupid stuff. I would be in great trouble if karma was going to be my judge. I'm believing in grace. I'm holding out for grace. I'm holding out that Jesus took my sins onto the cross because I know what I have done and who I am. And I hope I don't have to depend on my own religiosity or moral performance to get to God. The fourth claim of Jesus we must examine is this. Jesus alone claimed to be the savior of sins. Now, Buddha claimed to be a teacher, called himself a teacher. Muhammad, a teacher and a prophet. Jesus called himself a teacher, a prophet, and a savior, and of course, also God. And he says he came to rescue us from something that we could not rescue ourselves from, sin. Our enslavement to sin. All other religions say, by your best, work hard. You will earn merits. But only Christ says, it is done, it is done, it is done. The Bible says that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. And passage after passage, verses after verses in the Bible present to us Christ dying on the cross for us, offering his blood, offering grace and salvation as a free gift, eternal life as a free gift. All right? And that we find only in Jesus Christ. The fifth thing is this. Jesus alone started and sealed his life with the natural, supernatural, I'm sorry, supernatural. 
Only on Christ can we see that there is hundreds of years of prophecies fulfilled in his birth. Being born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, the death of uh, hundreds of children in Bethlehem at the time of his birth because Herod wanted to destroy him. All right, all of this is prophesied in scripture that he will be born in the manger. So hundreds of prophecies that are fulfilled to the most remarkable details makes him unique. It is supernatural. His virgin birth, it is absolutely supernatural. His resurrection from the dead makes him unique. The miracles in his life, through his life, makes him unique. All other religious leaders have a time and a place where they died. Only Jesus Christ has an empty grave. And the light has just gone out. So if you can see me in a little bit of darkness, we will continue. So you see, his supernatural life makes him unique. Now, Jesus promised that he would return from heaven and judge the earth. So we have to give credence to his beliefs in that area, to his statements in that area too. Okay, to keep it on, keep it on. Yeah. Now, the fourth thing you must examine is this. Even if we believe that Jesus is the way, okay, we must still affirm that there is good and truth wherever we find it. Now, the, the good and truth in other religions may be there, in um, the truth about character and morality and uh, discipline, sacrifice, humility. You know, we find that every person we meet can teach us something. And there are people of other religions who can teach us a lot about humility and kindness and courage and so on. So we must acknowledge that there is good in other places, but the good that we find in other religions is not sufficient to lead us to salvation, which is the greatest need of mankind. All right. Now, the fifth thing is this. It is logically absurd that all religions are all true at the same time. This is the common popular belief. We go and preach the gospel to many homes and they say, well, all religions are the same. I believe in Christ. I believe in others. Even some Christians are beginning to say those things. All religions are essentially the same. The answer is no. See, we must examine and whether this is true. Now, this view was espoused by a man called John Hicks in the form of analogy about an elephant and three blind men. He said that if these men were trying to figure out what an elephant was by touching the elephant, they would only pick up on some parts of the elephant, that they would be blindfolded and touching the elephant. The one touching the leg would say it is a tree. The one touching the ear would say that it is a fan. The one touching the they would say that it is a rope. In the same way he claimed all religions are glimpses into one supreme reality. Now the problem with this analogy is that all three men were wrong. It was not a fan, a rope or a tree that they were touching, it was an elephant. So the problem with this theory is that it contradicts the law of non-contradiction which says that something cannot be A and non-A at the same time. Consider some of the contradictions that arise if we believe that all religions are right in all the claims. For example, what happens when we die? Atheists say we don't exist. Hindus say we reincarnate in their different form. Christianity says we face God and we are judged for our works or our sins. Now that can all be happening at the same time. Either one is right. Not all can be right. What is God like? Hindus say God is an impersonal force that is really everything. Everything is God and God is in everything. Classical Buddhism does not even believe there is a God. Islam says that he is exalted but not approachable. Christianity says he is separate from creation. He is a personal being. He is both exalted at the same time he is, can be approachable. He can be, we can be intimate with him. Now that can all be true. Only a person who is clueless about the world religions will say they're all the same because the truth is they are not the same. Every religion is essentially different from all others. 
Okay. The sixth point is this. Regardless of what we believe as Christians, we should avoid two dangers. Love without truth and truth without love. Love without truth is sentimental beliefs, emotional. That is what we see in the world today, even in the church. We want to love the world without truth. Now, Jesus came to bring us grace and truth, not just grace, but grace and truth, not just truth, but truth with grace. So we must have both. Truth without love is brutal. Love without truth is sentimental. Current culture in the world is largely guilty of the first one. Loving without truth. Loving without truth is sentimental. It's like everyone needs love. Um, you know, the world needs love. Love everyone. And so we begin to accept the degradation of moral ethics and beliefs in the effort to love everyone. We start condoning the beliefs and the uh, sinful lifestyle of many in the false belief that we must just love all. But that's love with sentiments and without truth. On the other hand, we have truth without love. And the church in the past has been largely guilty of that, to be claiming and preaching truth without love. And that can be brutal. That can be uh, ruthless. And it can even cause people to turn away from Christ because we proclaim a truth without love. Okay. And much of the uh, things that Christianity has done in the past, such as the Crusades, uh, the light is back, praise God, and uh, persecutions of other faiths has risen out of that belief. Now we know, according to Christ, grace and truth, we both need love and truth. Okay? So if we become convinced that Jesus is the only way, we should live out that conviction in the spirit of Christ, which is love and also truth. All right? So that is the way I think we must live out our lives as Christians. Even when we claim that Jesus is the only way, and absolutely Jesus is the only way to God, it must be proclaimed in a spirit of love and truth. So to conclude this part, it is true that we can find revelation of goodness and truth in all faith. However, salvation can only be found in Christ. And salvation is the only way to God. So in other words, Jesus is the only way to God. And we claim that with all love, with all grace, and with all humility. Right? So that is what I believe Christianity enables us to believe. All right. Let's look at the second question for today. And please feel free to put up your questions on the chat. I will look at it at the end. How can a good God send people to hell? Now, this question is becoming very popular with the increase of grace teachings in these days. To the point that many people are now teaching that a good God cannot send people to hell. So even if people go to hell, ultimately they will be saved. There are some people who teach that. Some people teach that a good God cannot send people to hell for eternity. So even if they go there, ultimately the people in hell will be eternally destroyed. They will cease to exist. And only those that are with God in heaven will be existing for eternity. And there are some belief in universalism where they say that everyone will ultimately be saved, even the ones that go to hell and who don't believe in Jesus Christ today. All right, now this is a very loaded question. Um, however, we try to answer this question, it seems like it is doomed from the beginning. How can a good God send people to hell? It's like asking you the question, um, when did you stop beating your wife? Um, however you answer the question, it seems like you are guilty from the beginning. So we have to look at to the scriptures to really understand whether this is true, all right? Now we know God is a good God. That is absolutely true in the scriptures. We know God is holy, he is righteous, and he's also good, he's loving. So we know that God is perfect, his character and his morality is perfect, his justice is perfect, 
And so we have to answer this question based on the understanding of the nature of God. Okay, so let's look at a couple of scriptures here. First Peter, if you would look at, I'm sorry, second Peter chapter three, verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, not willing that any should perish. So God is not willing that any should perish. Another scripture is in Timothy. Second, first Timothy chapter two, verse four. Who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So God desires all men to be saved. That's the heart of God, that no one should perish, that all men should be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So the first thing to establish is this. God is good. He sent Jesus to die for the sins of all humanity, the whole world. And thirdly, it is not God's desire that even a single person go to hell. It is not God's desire that anyone go to hell. All right. So the question, how can a good God send people to hell is wrong. Number one, why? Because God does not send people to hell. What do I mean? Well, firstly, people send themselves. People send themselves to hell. It is not God sending people to hell as much as the people choosing to go there. Now, the Bible is clear. God hates hell and he hates people going there. God is patient. He does not want anyone to perish. And he has done everything he will to stop people from going to hell. How? He has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. He has given us the revelation of his word. He has put the church on the earth to proclaim the gospel. And he continues to do so even today by releasing the Holy Spirit on the earth and through the preaching of the gospel, convicting the hearts of men to believe in Jesus Christ. So there's a huge roadblock he has put so that people can look at that sign. And that is the cross. That is Jesus Christ. That if you will believe in him, you do not have to perish but you will have eternal life. But if people choose to disbelieve and reject and reject the gospel, it is not God who sends them. It is they themselves who are choosing to live life in their own terms and thereby they choose hell in a sense. What is hell? Hell, the Bible says, let me show you one scripture in 2 Thessalonians, Chapter 1, verse 9, verse 2nd Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 8. Um, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. All right, so hell is a place of eternal destruction, a place of punishment for those who do not believe in Jesus Christ and host those who do not know God, all right? Now, we have to establish from the word that hell does exist because there are some who now are teaching that hell does not exist. And all the pictures of um, outer darkness, uh, gnashing of teeth, uh, lake of fire are just metaphors to describe a state of existence without God. But the Bible gives us credence to believe that um, hell is a literal place, all right? Now, in that literal place, of course, I believe it is the absence of everything that is God and therefore the absence of everything that is good. We live in a world today on the earth where there is good and evil coexisting. We live in a world today where it has aspects of heaven and there's also aspects of hell. There are places on the earth which are totally God forsaken. And then there are places on the earth which are full of God's presence and blessing and good people. But when we talk about hell, it will be a place which is completely bereft of anything that um, is of God's nature, that is of God's light, that is of God's grace. And so uh, more than the punishment and the suffering 
and the pain. I believe the, the, the tragedy of hell would be that it would be bereft, bereft of anything that is gone, anything that is life. And that would be the place of eternal torment that people would be suffering for eternity because they have rejected Christ today. So hell is not a place where people are consigned or punished to because um, they were bad people or because they did some sins. No, it's a place where people choose to go because they do not believe in Jesus Christ and they do not choose to live according to faith in Jesus, according to the gospel. All right, so is hell a real place? I believe it is, and I believe the Bible says that it is a real place. Okay, um, what about the punishment? Does it fit the crime? Um, you know, just not believing Jesus, does it merit the punishment of hell? Now, very few of us would have a problem with justice being served on a guilty criminal because we're all hardwired instinctively to want justice to be done. Why does the concept of hell offend people today? Perhaps it's because we feel like the punishment of hell does not fit the crime. We feel like it is overdone, extreme. It's just the hatred of God. It's just God being very vengeful. Maybe that's what we think. Now, why are people today punished on the earth for crimes they do? Now, we all know and understand that the degree to which a person merits punishment today is not proportional to the length of time it took to commit the crime. Example, a murder can take 10 seconds, but his punishment can be 20 years of imprisonment, even life. Someone can be stealing furniture and it takes half the day and their punishment could be um, 20,000 rupees fine and three months imprisonment. The degree of someone's crime is not related to how long it took to commit the crime, but a matter of how severe they did this. So what's the most heinous person a thing can do? Abuse, rape, torture, murder? See, most of our answers revolve around a disregard for the sanctity of life. But what about when we disregard the sanctity of the life giver? What about ignoring, uh, rebelling, uh, distorting, um, rejecting the very one who gives us the air to breathe, the very one who has created us and gives us existence? When we offend, a finite law, like the law of a land, the consequences are finite. When we offend an infinite being, I believe the consequences are infinite. And yet it is not God who is vengefully, um, you know, taking vengeance with those who, un who are unbelievers because of his hatred. No, God doesn't desire people to go to hell. Yet it is what they choose because God has given us all free will. Okay. Now, in John chapter 3, I want to read out this portion of scripture to you. John chapter 3, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. So God's heart is never to condemn people to hell, but that the world through him might be saved. But then it is not universal salvation because God gives people the freedom to choose. If people would just ultimately all be saved then that is not genuine free will. That's not genuine grace. There is no place for people to choose. It is just God doing what he wills. In John chapter three, verse 36, the Bible says, he who believes in the son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So the wrath of God abides on the one that does not believe in Christ. Okay, so hell is actually a testimony to the freedom that God gives us. Now, the Bible says that hell was originally created for the devil and his angels, not for people. However, hell will serve as the final destination for those who have rejected a relationship with God. Now, 
Do you know that God has given us choice today? In the beginning, when he created Adam, he gave him a choice. All right? Even today, God has given us the choice. And his choice given to us is in honor of our own freedom. That because we are created in the image of God. He honors our freedom. God does not require that we receive his forgiveness by force. Right? He respects our ability to make our own decisions. If we refuse a relationship with him, he grants us our desire. God does not force us to believe in him. And that's why even today, it is not God who comes in the revelation of his glory and splendor and preaches the gospel to people today. Because if people were to see God face to face, they would believe in him. But then there would not be much choice in the hearts of people there because now they see him in the glory of his splendor. And they're compelled to get down on their knees. God gives the responsibility to the church, to people like you and me, so that as we preach the gospel, people have the freedom to reject or accept. He honors the freedom of choice that he has made man to have in his image. G.K. Chesterton from England, a uh, uh, philosopher, Christian philosopher, that's what he says. Hell is God's great compliment to the reality of human freedom and the dignity of human choice. Those who respond to his invitation of grace by trusting in Jesus as savior, he gives everlasting life. Those who don't cannot receive everlasting life. And the thing about God is that he's faithful to his word. He cannot change his word. Okay. That is why C.S. Lewis said, there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, let your will be done. And those to whom God says, all right, let your will be done. Okay. The important thing to recognize is that we are not the only ones unsettled by the thought of hell. God doesn't want anyone to experience life or eternity apart from him. And that's why he took on human flesh, hung on a cross, died for us, shed his blood for us, experienced all the sufferings that mankind can, and made a way for us to be saved. So the real point here should be whether, um, you know, does a loving God send people to hell? No, the real point is, what are you doing with the good news that Jesus has died for you to be saved so that you do not go to hell? What are you doing with that truth? And I believe are responding to the truth is more important than grappling with this question why loving God sends people to hell. Okay, all right, let's look at the next question. Um, is Bible morality outdated? Is the Bible's moral code outdated? It's very important for us to understand because we are in the face of popular culture where a lot of our beliefs in the scripture are being challenged today, day by day, through media, through social media, through even our own friends in secular institutions challenging our claims of biblical ethics. Humanists reject the claim that the Bible is the word of God. They are convinced the book was written by humans. This is what they say, by humans in an ignorant, superstitious, and cruel era, Bible times. They believe that because the writers of the Bible lived in an unenlightened era before scientific revolution, industrial revolution, technological revolution, they say the book contains many errors and harmful teachings. And yes, the church is guilty to a large extent in the past for holding on to a lot of beliefs that were against uh, scientific rationalism. Um, in the times of Galileo, you know, the church believed that uh, the earth was the center of the universe and everything revolved around the earth, but that's not what science proves now to us. But we know that the Bible does not really contradict science. It's just that the Bible is not the book of science, but there are many things in the Bible that are scientific that was already there years before it was discovered. For example, the book of Job says that the earth hangs on nothing, space, all right? So, uh, the Bible is really a book of salvation. It's not a Bible. It's not a book on politics, even though you can find political truth there. It's not a book on business, even though you can find principles for business. The Bible is a book that teaches us about God and the way to salvation. 
However, the Bible does reveal to us the absolute moral laws of God. Now, humanists say that Bible was written in a culture and society that is old and outdated, and therefore its codes are not applicable to us today. Now, if we believe that, then we will have to redefine our moral ethics, especially sexual morality, our definition of whether homosexuality is acceptable or not, the gender classifications that people from the liberal left want to shove down our throat nowadays, that there's not just two genders, but there are over a hundred different genders. So what do we accept? All right, I'm just gonna go straight to the points why I believe that uh, the Bible's moral standard is absolute, it is objective, and it is right. And I'm just going to show it to you from the word of God. Firstly, God created us. And so he has the right to hold us to his moral standard. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So because God created us and made us in his image, we belong to him. And we are obligated to live life according to his standard. The creator decides how the created will live. The one who creates the car is the one who decides the systems on which the car will run. God created us and therefore he is the one who determines the moral standards that are essential to our success as human beings, that are essential to us living life in absolute um, blessing and life that he intended us to live here on the earth. And the one who created has the authority to determine those standards, okay? So we believe, I believe that God's standards are absolutes, they are true because God is the one who created us, all right? Secondly, God's moral standard flows from his unchanging nature. So his standard is absolute. Why I say absolute, this means it is unchanging. People say truth and uh, wrong, right and wrong is relative. Um, what may be right to you may not be right to me. What may be right in one culture may be wrong in another culture. So um, you can have situational ethics. Uh, you can do what you feel like. Uh, what may be right in one generation is not right in the other, so values keep on changing, and therefore the Bible must change, our interpretation of the Bible must change. And so even entire denominations have accepted homosexuality, they have accepted homosexual clergy, and have ordained them based on this belief. Now I believe God's moral standard is unchanging because his character, his nature is unchanging the immutability of God. God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God has not changed from the beginning of Genesis to the end in Revelations. He's still the same God of righteousness, justice, mercy, truth, holiness. Now, people argue that God's moral standards are merely his personal preferences that have changed. They bring up the Old Testament passages where God commanded the Israelites to slaughter the Canaanites, even the women and the children. But then, you know, what seemed to be a God that was a harsh in the Old Testament seems to be a God that is so gracious and loving in the new. And that is what they argue with. Um, in the old, they were allowed to have two or three wives, many wives, but then they knew just one. So they use these arguments to show that God's moral standards were his personal preferences that changed. However, these do not prove that God has changed. Now, understand this, listen to my words very carefully. God's rules to men may change because his truth is progressively revealed. There is progressive revelation from Genesis to now. Different dispensations. For example, God's laws to the Israelites about animal sacrifices do not apply to us today because God has sent Jesus 
as the fulfillment of all the sacrifices and there's no longer any more sacrifices required. But God's character and his moral standards have not changed from the beginning to the end. His rules to man changed because of progressive revelation. All right. And this is something you will understand even in principles of scriptural interpretation. There is progressive revelation to scripture. The revelation of God that we see in Jesus is superior to the revelation that Abraham had about God. It's the same God, but just revealed in greater glory, greater brightness. The atheists or others confuses God's rules to man at various stages of the past dispensations. They confuse it to his moral character. This is like comparing apples to oranges. God's moral character has not changed from the beginning to the end. He had always a consistent response to sin. God is just and he does judge sin, including the Canaanites that were wiped out by Israel who were there in the promised land. See, they were, we don't see the grace of God even in that. For 400 years plus, when Israel was in Egypt, they were given time to repent from the wickedness. God has always balanced his justice and mercy. All right, in the scriptures, always showing mercy to sinners, giving them time to repent. Now, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God says, I am the Lord, I do not change. Hebrews chapter 3, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God does not change. His moral standard flows from his perfect holy nature. His moral standards flows from his perfect justice and righteousness. So if his nature is unchanging, his standard is also absolute. Another reason why we believe God's moral standards have not changed and are not absolute is this, not obsolete. This. God cannot sin. If God cannot sin, his standard is objective. See, God's moral standards flows from his unchanging nature. His nature is perfect and holy. He cannot sin. He has no sin. Jesus, even on the earth, in human form, had no sin. He did not sin. Therefore, the standards of God are objective. They are not subjective, changing from time to time, culture to culture, nation to nation. No. It is impossible for God to contradict himself or act inconsistently with his own nature. Second Timothy, I want to read this to you. Chapter 2 Verse 13, the Bible says, if we are faithless or mankind is faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He cannot deny his nature. What is his nature? He cannot sin. The example of an objective moral absolute is this. God cannot sin. And God prohibits lying. One of the ten, uh, ten Commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness. God prohibits lying. And this is a standard that flows from his nature. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. The Bible says that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. It is impossible for God to lie. Okay, please mute yourselves, wherever you guys are. Okay. It is impossible for God to lie. That's his nature. So his standard given to us, do not lie, it flows from his nature. It flows from his nature. Why does God say do not lie? Honesty is good. Lying is bad. Lying is evil. Why? Because he himself cannot lie. God is not a man that he should lie. God cannot lie. That's his nature. So his moral absolutes come from his nature. And the fourth thing is this. Why I believe God's moral standards, the Bible's moral ethics are not obsolete. They are the same today is that his word does not change. Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. God's words will never pass away. God's words will never fade away. God's words will never be irrelevant. God's words will never become obsolete. 
is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why? His word and him are the same. In fact, in Psalms 138, verse 2, the Bible says, God has magnified his word above his name. God holds his word above his name. And that is why the teachings on morality in the scripture are objective for all mankind in all cultures for all times. For example, Paul's teachings on homosexuality in Romans chapter 1, verse 26 to 27. It is not directed just to that culture. Paul's teachings on homosexuality is consistent with all of scripture from the beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 25, the Bible says God made man and then God made woman and brought them together. So even mankind's relationship in nature is male and female complementing one another. Leviticus 18 verse 22 prohibits same-sex behavior. And that's one of the reasons why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Sodom, where in the word comes uh, the practice of sodomy, sexuality in uh, homosexuality. See, God was against homosexual behavior from the beginning. Why? Because it is the antithesis of everything that is God's created order. In God's created order, male and female complement are natural complements of one another. That's the order of God. Homosexual behavior is rebellion against the order of God. God's created order. So when Paul talks about homosexuality, he's talking of homosexuality not directed to a specific culture, but in God's creation context, God's order. And so when people use the argument today that the rules for homosexuality were only for that time, and today, um, science has proven that there is a homosexual gene and so on, and therefore the church must accept homosexuality. It is reducing the standards of God's morality in the scriptures, which I believe it's again rebellion. All right, the times, the culture, 21st century millennial behavior has not made Bible morality outdated. Rather, it's becoming clearer and clearer that Bible ethics and Bible morality is the only way that mankind can be preserved and order can be established here on the earth. And that is what protects us. You see, all of these deviant behaviors uh, is proven over time that it is destructive to human nature. It is destructive to humans, destructive to societies. And we must understand this. God's laws are not given to restrict us. God's laws are not given so that God finds some, uh, some sadistic joy in um, finds some sadistic joy in in, um, in prohibiting us from joy, finding pleasure in sin. No, it's not out of some sadistic belief or sadistic uh, uh, satisfaction that God prohibits us by His laws. It is really uh, to protect us because God alone created us and he knows what is good for us. And so when he gives those laws to us, it is really for our own protection. It is really for our own optimum um, life here on the earth so that we can experience life to the best way that we can in his, in his blessing. And that is by following his moral laws. All right. Okay. Let's look at the next question. Um, why is there so much evil and suffering? If God is real, why is there so much evil and suffering? Okay, and I'll try to take as short as I can here and we'll close. Um, the issue of suffering is really uh, one of the most uh, frequently raised question and objection to the Christian faith because we're constantly confronted by suffering every day. Um, you know, in every, really, in every generation, I think people object to the Christian faith by the suffering that we see on the world. If Christ is real, if God is good, why are there rapes? Why are there abuses? Why is there famine? Why are there earthquakes? Um, there was a bomb blast in Lebanon today. 
You know, why do innocent people die? If God is good, why, why do all these things happen? We see suffering on a global scale, natural disasters. Right now, the COVID pandemic, is this from God? We're seeing a global scale pandemic. Uh, we are seeing community tragedies, plane crashing, um, some explosions that take, take away innocent lives. Suffering at an individual level, um, depression, sickness, uh, deaths, unhappy marriages, uh, poverty, absolute poverty. And that's again, one objection that people have towards Christianity. Why are so many people poor? If God is a God of love, why are so many people in India so poor? And why is there so much injust injustice and so on? See, no human is immune from suffering and suffering can be used by Satan to really make us question the goodness of God. Now, let me just note that uh, suffering does not seem to be a problem for other religions, but it's an acute problem for the Christian faith because in the Christian faith, we believe God is good, he's loving, he's compassionate, and he's all powerful. So if God is good and he's all powerful, why doesn't he do anything about all the evil and the suffering in the world? So we wrestled with this question for centuries, all right? Let's look at certain thoughts that we can find and really answer this question. Number one, the thoughts of human freedom. And that also answers the question, why do people go to hell? Suffering is not part of God's original creation. We know in Genesis chapter one and two that everything God created was good. There was no suffering, there was no sickness, there was no disease in the world that he created. And it was only after Adam sinned that curse came into the world and then the imperfection and the suffering came as a result of man's sin and not because of God's creation. And we know in the future, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. There'll be no more crime, there'll be no more pain. So that is God's perfect will. But in the meantime, we are going through a lifetime here on the earth where there is suffering, where there is evil. Why does God continue to allow it? We want to answer some of these questions. Now, why did God allow Adam and Eve to sin? Well, simply because he loves us and he wanted to give us free will. See, love is not love unless it is given the freedom to make a choice, to accept or reject. God made man in his image. God is not a robot. God made man in his image. So God has free will. God made us to have free will. God is agape love, dwelling in love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God made man to be able to love. Now, robots cannot love. Robots means they are forced to love. Only a being that has free will can love God freely. So it can only be love if there is a real choice. And so God gave human beings the choice and the freedom to love or not to love. So given this freedom, men from the beginning have chosen to break God's laws and the result has always been suffering. Now, why doesn't God remove the suffering as a result of his goodness, of his omnipotence, his ability? Man sins, that's fine. God gave man free will, man sins, but God can remove the effects of it. Now, C.S. Lewis says something very interesting. It would no doubt have been possible for God to remove by his miracles, the results of the first sin ever committed by a human being. But this would not have been much good unless God was prepared to remove the results of the second sin and of the third sin and the fourth sin. Why? Man would continue to sin. So would God keep on removing, cleaning up by miracles, by his omnipotent and sovereign, all our mistakes? If the miracle ceased, then sooner or later, we might have reached our present lamentable situation. If they did not, then the world thus continually underpropped and corrected by divine interference would have been a world in which nothing important ever depended on human choice and in which choice itself would soon cease from the certainty that one of the apparent alternatives before you would lead to no results and was therefore not really an alternative. Sounds quite confusing. What it really means is this. If God would supernaturally come and remove the results of all our sins every time, then it would be a world where we had no choice. That even though I choose sin, 
the consequence of it would never be experienced by me. That means I would never be free to love him by my own free will and my own determination. And I would never grow to be a son of God in maturity. All right. So by him intervening in removing the consequence of our sin is almost like he takes away the, he takes away that authority that we have in our own choice. He takes away the, um, our ability to choose and thereby it cannot be a genuine relationship of love. Now, suffering is a result of our own sin. Now, let me qualify this. Some of the suffering we endure is a result of our own sin. Of course, it resulted from Adam's sin, but even today when we sin, some of the results of our own sin is our own suffering. For example, if you put your hand in the fire, your hand will get burnt. So there are God's moral laws. And if you break those laws, we go through consequences. If you jump from your rooftop, you're going to fall to the ground and probably break your head or your bones. Why? That's the law of gravity. So there are moral laws. When we break those moral laws, it begins to have consequences in our lives. If you abuse drugs, it will affect your physical. If you walk in hatred and unforgiveness, it will affect your heart and also your relationships. So they are a result of our own sin. Secondly, suffering is also a result of other people's sins. Much of the suffering in the world is a result of other people's sins. This is true of many global and community disasters, wars, caused by people's ambitions, human sins. Even if the sin is on both sides, on one side, um, it's because of people's sin. Much of the starvation in the world is caused by the greed of humanity. It's not because God is not a good God. It's the greed of humanity. Economic wars. You see, natural disasters are not a form of punishment from God. It's just that the world, the creation is in a broken state. Okay. Individual suffering can be caused by the sin of others, murder, adultery, theft, rape, abuse, selfishness. We hurt others because of our sin or others hurt us because of our sin. And third, there's a suffering as a result of a fallen world. Natural disasters, sicknesses is a fallen world. Creation has been subjected to frustration. Romans chapter eight, verse 20. Let me just read that out to you so that we understand, even in the light of the present pandemic, that we understand that creation itself is groaning. Romans chapter eight, verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. So even creation has been subjected to corruption because of Adam's sin. Not willingly, but because of Adam's sin. So natural disasters are a result of this disorder in creation. All right. Now, despite whatever suffering we see in the world, you must understand this. God works through suffering. Suffering is never good in itself, but God is able to use it for the good in a number of different ways. Firstly, suffering can be used by God to draw us to Christ. I'm not saying the suffering came by God but the suffering draws us to Christ. Now, when we talk about suffering, we must place suffering in its proper context. We don't suffer what Jesus suffered for us on the cross. Guilt, condemnation, that's not what God wants you to suffer. Sickness, that's not God, what God wants you to suffer. Why? Jesus paid for that on the cross. We receive his blessings, his inheritance by grace. But there are legitimate suffering which we go through on this earth because of our faith in Christ as Christians, all right? That's persecution, rejection by man, shame, abuse because of our belief in the word of God and so on. But then there are also different sufferings we go through because of what happens to people around us in life, to community, the region where we live, all right? All suffering can be used by God to draw us to Christ. C.S. Lewis wrote this, and I read this so many years back. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our consciousness, but he shouts in our pain. Suffering is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. No doubt pain is used as God's megaphone. 
Now, I'm not saying the pain comes from him, but he can use that for good to redeem us into the truth. So it gives opportunity for people to make amends, to repent. And this has proved time and again in Christian experience. People through divorce, sickness, broken relationships, poverty, in the midst of that, they have come to know God. And when they have known God, they have been restored again. Secondly, God uses suffering to bring us to Christian maturity. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, Jesus learned obedience from the things that he suffered. So God uses suffering to build a character. When you go through pain, it brings out strength within us. It causes us to rely on his grace. His glory rests upon us and his strength is made perfect in our weakness. All right. So he refines us. It's like his refining process and causes gold to come out of us. All right. Um, thirdly, God uses suffering to bring about his good purposes. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So God can use suffering to bring out his purpose. For example, Joseph. Joseph suffered, but God brought out uh, his purpose to preserve Israel. And Joseph himself said that it was in God's plan to send me to Egypt as a slave, speaking to his brothers, so that he could be there in the position of authority and so when the time of famine comes, he was able to provide protection to his own family. So Joseph went through suffering, but God brought good out of it for his purposes to be fulfilled. And let me tell you this, he faced uh, slavery, um, imprisonment, trials, temptation. Um, I mean, terrible what he went through, but God brought good out of that. So God can bring good out of what's happening during the pandemic time, whatever you're going through. Just keep your hope in God wherever you are. God provides a future. And his future is what? Eternity, where there is no more suffering, there's no more pain, there's no more tears. Whatever suffering you're going through, you may feel it's unjustified, it is injustice. Well, you know, we just have to hold on to the grace of God. Nothing in the world happens in perfect justice, in perfect deserving. We just have to trust in the grace of God, all right? But know this, God has all of eternity to make up to you. And scripture is full of promises about how wonderful heaven is. God's going to establish a new heavens and a new earth. And even one day, even though you may be suffering in your body today, big body, you're always sick. One day you will have a glorious resurrected body, which will never be sick. So we must have an eternal perspective to suffering. We live in a materialistic world that has lost its eternal perspective. We want to have all the blessings of God here right now. But yes, there are blessings of God for today and there are blessings for eternity. We need to have a long-term view and understand the suffering of this life in the context of eternity. And if we do so, this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 really helps us to put this in perspective. He says, for we do not lose hearts, even though our outward man is perishing, Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For a light affliction, which is but for a moment, a light affliction of suffering is for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Eternal weight of glory. So the temporary suffering you're going through is working for you. Your suffering is not your master. Your suffering is your slave. It is working for you. It's building character. It's building faith. It's causing you to have thoughts about Christ and it's causing you to depend on him. And not only that, it's working for you an exceeding and eternal. That means it is causing the glory of God to rest upon you and it is for eternity. So do not look at the things which you can see, but look at the things which you cannot see. Amen. So have an eternal perspective of your suffering. It is working on your behalf. And this point, it really blesses me to know this. God is involved in our suffering. See, God is a God who suffers alongside with us. And this is proven in Jesus Christ, who came as a man, was in all points tempted as we are, 
suffer, not only with my sin, but the sins of all humanity on the cross. And by his death makes a way for us to be saved. He became one with us, all right? That means he knows about suffering. He's acquainted with our infirmities, with the feeling of our infirmities. That's what the Bible says. He knows what we are feeling. He knows what we are suffering. And he is right there with you. He's right there. So when you see how Jesus took your infirmities, he was acquainted with all the weaknesses of the flesh. He did not sin, yet he was acquainted with it. He was tempted with lust. He was tempted with, um, with unforgiveness. He was tempted with every temptation we go through, yet without sin. The knowledge that Jesus suffered for us removes the suffering in our suffering. One of the suffering that we go through in our suffering is this. We feel really alone and we feel, why? Why am I suffering? So we suffer in our suffering. Self-pity develops in our suffering. But when you know that God is involved in your suffering, he's acquainted with the feeling of your infirmities. He, even when you know you are not alone, then you won't suffer in your suffering. You will go through it with joy in your heart. Count it all joy when you go through various trials, the Bible says. So don't suffer in your suffering. There may be suffering that you're going through. It's painful. But in your heart, count it all joy. Praise God and just be in this faith that he loves you. He's with you and you're not alone. All right. So how do we respond in suffering? Hold on to hope. Hold on to his word. Hold on to his character. He's faithful. He does not lie. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Amen. Hallelujah. So these are the things that I have for us today. All right, let me look at some of the questions that you guys have. Do we accept Christ in a free will or is it predestined? For it says in the Bible, God has already predestined those who's chosen to believe in him. That's a great question that brings to light um, something that I discussed last week about Calvinism, which says that grace is irresistible. If God has already chosen you and predestined you, then you cannot resist the grace of God. You are just saved. That means you are part of the elect. And then there are those that even though they want to believe God, if God has not chosen them, they cannot be saved. Now, I don't believe in that. I believe that atonement is not only for the elect, for those who are predestined, Atonement is for all humanity. Christ died for the sins of the whole world. But I also believe that there is free will in mankind, that man has the ability to accept or reject. And so the grace of God will come upon us. I can accept it or reject it. So it is in our free will that we accept Christ. Now, when you accept Christ in your free will, it is... God who has predestined you. Now, we cannot really understand the mechanics and the operation of this. We just have to believe the scriptures that we read. The Bible says it is by our belief in Christ that we are saved. Christ has saved us, but we must also believe. So it is man and God working hand in hand. All right. So when we believe, now we must, you see, we are trying to understand an infinite God, an eternal God who does not live in time. We are here in time. This is time. This is uh, the year uh, 1 BC, 180, and so on, 2020. You accepted Christ here maybe in the year 2000. Jesus died here before time. God was here, we think. So we are predestined. So how can God predestine us if I accepted God in the future? You know, uh, is it by my own free will or was it just planned and I just it was just on autopilot? So we grapple with these questions because we are trying by a finite mind to understand an infinite world, infinite realm, an infinite God who is not confined in time. This is time. You cannot go back to the past. You cannot go to the future. You are stuck in a specific point of time. So we're trying to understand theology in time, but you cannot understand theology only in time. Certain things you have to just accept as a fact because the Bible says so. So God is not limited by time. God does not dwell in time. God is outside of time. So God can see time from beginning to the end. God can see the, the, the end from the beginning. God can see right now, all of time right in front of him and God can intervene in any part of time right now. 
right now because God lives outside of time. <clears throat> so God can see that you accept Christ and so God can predestine you. You have accepted Christ here, but God can say, I have predestined you and God chooses you because you have chosen him. You know, it's a concept that is difficult to understand, but I don't believe in irresistible grace. I believe that you have a say in whether you choose to believe God or not. And even that is the spirit of grace that is working in you. Even your ability to believe in God is a gift from God. And yet it is also an exercise of your faith. Okay, so Lovi, um, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure. Yes, that is true. He has predestined us, but it's also because we believed. But how can he choose us before time when we choose in time? That's what we think. But we have to understand it outside of time. From God's perspective, he can see everything at one minute, or let's say one second, he can see everything from the end of time to the beginning. And so he sees that you choose, and so he chooses you. That's what I believe, okay? So that's why I believe that, um, you know, because when you believe in irresistible grace, then um, why is there a need to preach the gospel? Because even though you preach the gospel, only those who are predestined will be saved. Those who are not predestined will not be saved. Only the elect will be saved. The non-elect will not be saved. So why preach the gospel? So you end up in a very uh, passive kind of faith. And um, I mean, to my own experience, uh, many people who believe in that have become very um, passionless, uh, having no zeal in preaching the gospel to the world because they just rely on, well, the grace of God will save them anyway, you know. Okay, which prayer is correct? After prayer, say your will be done or prayer of persistence, someone is asking. Well, you know, there are different types of prayer, okay? And you have to know what type of prayer you're praying and what time. Now, saying, saying at the end of every prayer, let your will be done is not right. Because Jesus did not pray, let your will be done at the end of every prayer when he was multiplying the bread and the fish he did not say let your will be done no he was absolutely certain the bread is going to multiply when he said Lazarus come forth from the grave he did not say let your will be done he said Lazarus come forth it was a prayer of authority so you have to know what prayer you are praying and add the appropriate words there there's a time for you to pray persistently and pray continually. There's a time to take authority in the name of Jesus. There's a time to pray with absolute confidence. It is the will of God, for example, healing, salvation. Now, when do I pray, let your will be done? Well, Jesus prayed that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane just once. And he was praying a prayer of consecration. He was consecrating his will to the will of God. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done consecrating to the will of God. So this prayer is called the prayer of consecration. When you consecrate your life to God's hand, that's when you pray, let your will be done. However, when you're praying other forms of prayer, you do not add at the end of every prayer, let your will be done, all right? If you add at the end of every prayer, let your will be done, it's a prayer of unbelief. Okay? All right, the two Bible verses in the beginning. I think it is 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And it's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, 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 okay. To keep the Sabbath is one of the 10 commandments. The early church kept the Sabbath, not Sunday. In these times, is it necessary to follow the real Sabbath day? All right, you know, let me ask this question. Do you mix wool and linen? Because the Bible says that you should not mix wool and linen according to the law of Moses. So if you are wearing any pants or t-shirt where there's wool and linen in it, you have broken the law. So 
why are people so concerned about the law of the Sabbath? All right. Now, there is a truth that we must understand about the Sabbath. And this is this number one. The Sabbath really points to Christ. The Sabbath is a day of rest. Sabbath means rest. Now, when Christ comes, we rest from our works. We rest from our self-righteousness because Jesus is our rest. Jesus is our Sabbath. All right? So the fulfillment of Jesus Christ. The second thing is, okay, somebody is, the second yeah. thing is this. Mm -hmm. All right. The second thing is this. Now that noise really knocked me off. What was I saying? All right. There's a principle of rest. Physical rest, mental rest, emotional rest. I believe a day of the week, every human being must rest. And the rest will lead to more productivity, will lead to a healthier life, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally. Rest is essential. All right. Now, people must find their own way of resting. If we want to rest according to the Sabbath laws, then we cannot just keep one of the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath, and forget the nine. Because the law is a composite whole. You cannot take one or two laws and try to observe today. The Bible says you either keep the ten, like even if you break one, you have broken the whole. So you cannot just take the Sabbath and keep it and then think that you are keeping the law of God. No. All right. So is there a need for the Sabbath? Yes, I believe there's a Sabbath rest, but I don't believe that you keep it according to the way it was kept in the old uh, Testament times. The early church kept the Sabbath. Um, it's because the early church, the first church in the first 10, 15 years was just Jewish people. So they observed a lot of the Jewish laws. But when the church began to have more Gentiles, then the church moved away from um, observing the Sabbath and was actually observing the first day of the week as the resurrection uh, day, the Lord's day. And that's what they developed as a practice. Okay, so that's the answer for that. Um, if you really keep the Sabbaths, um, you know, I mean, the thing is, Christians will say, hey, we must keep the Sabbath, but they eat a lot of pork on the Sabbath day, you know? So <laughs> you're not supposed to eat pork if you really want to keep the law, but we eat so much pork on Sunday and we say, oh, I kept the Sabbath. So a lot of times it's just sentiments. It's not the truth. We're just calling on to sentiments of religiosity and not establishing the truth. And that's why it keeps us in bondage. If someone believes in Jesus as his or her personal savior, but commits suicide, okay. That's a great question. Now, let me just say this from the beginning. I think God is more gracious than we think he is. God is more merciful than we think he is. And in such things, I believe God knows the answer better than us. But I will also say this. Um, people are driven to suicide for many reasons. We never know to what extent that pain, that depression, that fear has taken a hold of him that has driven him to suicide. Sometimes people are not in their right minds. So would God hold that against them? You see, suicide is nowhere mentioned in the Bible as a willful sin against Christ, rejecting Christ. Okay. So I believe that God is more gracious. God is more forgiving. God is more um, compassionate than we think he is. And so in the case of those who commit suicide, I would say this, only God knows. Uh, there are some things we cannot say for certainty based on scriptures. But what we are certain of is that God is gracious. God is merciful. God is kind. And only God knows the state of the heart and the mind when they took that uh, step. And we are not to judge. And I don't think at any funeral we should ever be saying uh, because they committed suicide, they are in hell. I don't think pastors, preachers, believers should ever be saying that. Okay. Any other questions? And so, like, for example, I think last Sunday, our prayer asked the question about um, Judas. Is he forgiven or not? You know, 
Now, the Bible doesn't give us sufficient scriptures to believe whether he was forgiven or not, whether he had salvation or not. So we cannot really base any conclusion on the evidence of scripture. However, I think we should stay, whatever conclusions we find from scripture must be from the clear revelation of scripture. And the clear revelation of scripture is that we cannot lose our salvation. There are tons of scripture that tell us that once saved, we are saved. And so we stick to what the scripture clearly reveals. What the scripture does not clearly reveal, we don't make that very dogmatic. We don't need to have arguments based on that. But what we should be firm upon is what the scripture reveals, okay? The two doctrines that God is sovereign and God needs our prayers to intervene, okay? That's, that's a long teaching. I cannot really say that with a lot of clarity here, but, um, you know, the sovereignty of God uh, and the will of man, it interweaves and interplays in history. There's God's sovereignty, yes, and in the end, it will be according to God's will, but God also works with the will of men in history. We can see that God has always worked with the will and the faith of mankind involved. So it seems that God has different paths. The objective is clear. The vision is clear. Um, God's will will be done, but there are different paths to bring us to it. And it seems like we have a role in what paths uh, will be chosen by us, even in our own personal lives. Um, to bring forth God's perfect will in our lives, God's calling in our lives. So God's sovereign, but at the same time, you have a part to play. That's clearly seen and evident in the scripture. Now, if we say God is sovereign, I don't need to pray. I don't need to fast. I don't need to go to church anymore. I'm already born again. We're trying to live a life on autopilot. And that takes away the human will, the human role in our faith. And that really leads to lazy and complacent Christianity and even opens the door for uh, you know, wrong beliefs that really begin to uh, drag, drag us down the path of the flesh again. Okay, do pets, animals go to heaven? Uh, interesting question. Mm, I really can't say. Um, I can say for sure that uh, children who die aborted are in heaven, um, but do pets or animals go to heaven? I don't think so. Okay, um, if you have a pet that you miss, well, you may miss because you're here on the earth, but once you get to heaven, I don't think you will miss your pet, so don't worry about that. Okay, all right, I think we are done here. I hope you guys are blessed. And yeah, let me just close with prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for everyone that has asked these questions and all the people that have joined us here today. I just pray that Lord, the revelation of your word will establish faith in our hearts, bring our hearts and our minds uh, into order to be in the knowledge of your will so that Lord, we can live lives that are glorifying to your name. Father, we thank you that in the end, all teaching, all discourse, all preaching points to Jesus Christ. Jesus is what holds our life together, Lord. Jesus is who we worship and who we exalt, and him must receive all the glory, Lord. So, Father, we just thank you for Jesus. We surrender our lives to Jesus once again, and we surrender our thoughts, our minds, our wills into Jesus' hands, and we pray, Lord, whatever we have discussed and shared, Father, in the end, let Jesus establish that in all of our lives, and let his name be alone magnified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. God bless you guys. Love you guys. Love every one of you. Um, hopefully we get to worship in All right. See you guys. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.